Good morning, everyone, and greetings from Michigan State University. And welcome to EAB University's 2018 Fall Webinar Series, which is funded by the USDA Forest Service. This is Robin Usborne, and along with my EAB University colleagues, Professors Cliff Sadoff and Elizabeth Barnes from Purdue University, and Amy Stone from The Ohio State University, we welcome you to today's webinar on Scientists versus Spotted Lanternfly, Updates on the Biology and Control of this Invasive Pest, presented by Heather Leach and Julie Urban from Pennsylvania State University. Heather is the Spotted Lanternfly Extension Associate in the Department of Entomology, and she is responsible for coordinating extension ever efforts related to education and outreach activities on the pest. Julie Urban is a senior research associate in the Department of Entomology, and she uses molecular tools such as gene barcoding to study microbes important to spotted, spotted lanternfly and other plant hoppers. Before we get started today, please know that we welcome your comments and questions, so please feel free to type them in the chat feature, which you can find by mousing over the bottom or occasionally the top of your screen on the taskbar. We will make a note of all the questions and have Heather and Julie respond to them when the presentation is finished. To keep these free webinars coming, we really need your feedback. After the webinar, you will be emailed a link to a short, voluntary, confidential survey that I hope you'll take the time to fill out. If you're one of the first 10 people to fill out the survey, we will be sending you an EAB goodie bag. For those of you wanting CEUs today, if you would like a certificate indicating that you participated in today's live webinar, complete the survey and send an email message to amystone at stone.91 at osu.edu. You will also receive these instructions in an email that I'll be sending out after the webinar. Certificates will be mailed to you within a week of today's program. This webinar is being recorded and will be available for viewing soon at www.emeraldashbor.info. You will also find the recordings for all previous EAB University webinars there. Thank you for attending today, and Julie and Heather, feel free to start your presentation. Great, thank you Robin for that introduction. Um, so today we'll be giving an update on spotted lanternfly. So some of you might have already heard of this bug or are somewhat familiar with this. Um, Just need insect. to unmute your audio. I believe I am unmuted. Can you not hear me, Robin? Robin, can you hear me? I'm not hearing you, Heather. Sorry. Okay. All right, we're unmuted now. Did that work? How about now? Can you hear us? Hello, can you hear us? Oh, so, um, so we're going to be giving an update on spotted lanternfly, this, this new invasive insect. Um, that is in Pennsylvania, as well as some other nearby states. Um, so as Robin gave a great introduction of us already, my name is Heather Leach. Uh, my title is the Spotted Lanternfly Extension Coordinator. Um, so I actually came from Michigan State University, previously working with another invasive insect, spotted wing Tophila. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to be giving this webinar to hopefully some, some Michiganders out there. Um, and Julie, do you want to go ahead and give yourself a brief introduction? Um, I'm a faculty member here at Penn State. I've been here for two years, but prior to that, all of my work, um, I've been trained in as a biologist, and as and I use DNA to reconstruct evolutionary relationships among lineages of plant hoppers, not just lantern flies, which is one of 21 families of plant hoppers, but you know all plant hoppers, and I study their coevolution with obligate bacterial and in some cases fungal symbionts. And so as part of my dissertation research um, about 10 years ago now, um, I studied, I focused in depth on the, on the lanternfly family Fulgoridae, 
And um, because these insects are mostly tropical, um, the spotted lanternfly, Lycorma delicatula, is the only single known pest in this group of 500 species. Um, we don't know much about the biology. And so um, when spotted lanternfly appeared within the US, um, colleagues of mine who detected it um, pinged me and asked me to do some genetics to follow up to see where it came from. And so I've been part of the technical working group um, of scientists around the world working on lanternfly since it was first detected in fall of 2014. Great, so with that, um, I'm gonna be giving a brief introduction of spotted lanternfly and, and kind of um, the status of it now in, in Pennsylvania, as well as um, New Jersey and Virginia. Um, and then Julie will be talking a lot about the research updates. So she's really heavily involved in, in the research that's going around around this insect. Um, so as she mentioned, uh, spotted lanternfly belongs in the plant hopper family for glority. Um, this is a very unique insect, um, especially considering that, you know, that it is a pest. Um, so it was first uh, found in southeastern Pennsylvania um, in a county called Berks County in 2014. Um, so that's that yellow portion. So she's southeast um, area of Pennsylvania that you're looking at. So in 2015, it expanded to that orange area, 2016 in that blue, and 2017 in that green. So it's currently um, in 13 counties in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, so as you can see, it certainly um, expanded its range and, and fairly rapidly, but we are really lucky to um, have uh, controlled it as much as we have today. Um, when you look at uh, spotted lanternfly in South Korea, where it is also an invasive species there, um, we saw a rampant spread throughout the rest of um, their country, and, and so they weren't able to contain it. So we're glad that, you know, we've got it um, uh, where it is now in, in terms of its population. So if we zoom out a little bit and look at some of um, the other states that are dealing with spotted lanternfly, again, there's those 13 counties that we have in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, just this year, New Jersey has found spotted lanternfly um, in uh, three counties bordering Pennsylvania. Um, so they have gone ahead and quarantined those. And then uh, Virginia also has a small population near Winchester, so they um, have that, that county um, uh, for spotted lanternfly. Um, just briefly, I would talk about um, some of the other discoveries that we found for spotted lanternfly. Um, so it was found in Delaware in 2017. This was just a single find. Um, and so as far as we know, there is not an established population there. Um, but again, this kind of uh, explains how it does have the capacity to hitchhike to various areas. Um, similarly, it was discovered in New York last year um, in that yellow county um, highlighted in the image there. Again, that was just a single find, but as of um, two days ago, we also um, had two new detections of spotted lanternfly found in the Finger Lake region. Um, this is something that we really want to watch for carefully. Um, as some of you might know, Finger Lakes is is known for producing a lot of wines and spotted lanternfly is attacking um, grapes. And so this is something uh, we really wanna make sure that you are all aware of is what spotted lanternfly looks like, what the threat is posed, and, and make sure you know how to, how to monitor for it as best as, as we know now. Um, so briefly, I'll go through the life cycle. So we have one generation per year in Pennsylvania. So the eggs are the overwintering stage, um, and, I'll, and I'll show you some photos of what those look like as well. Um, but they hatch in the spring. Um, they go through four nymphal instars until they reach adulthood. So those first three instars look fairly similar. They're black with bright white spots. The last instar becomes quite a bit larger and it's bright red, so fairly conspicuous um, uh, immatures. And then the adults, which you might be familiar with what they look like, they're also um, fairly obvious looking insects and they're, they're very unique. Um, so just to give you an idea of the life, cycle, life stages of all of these um, real pictures, um, the eggs uh, are first laid in about late early fall, so late September is when we're expecting to, to see these, um, these guys lay eggs. Uh, they're eight, laid in masses of about 30 to 50 eggs, and then they're covered with um, sort of a putty-like covering. Uh, after you know this, this egg mass goes through the overwintering stage, that putty-like covering starts to age and will start to look like cracked mud. Uh, we believe that this is how uh, this insect was introduced to the United States, is that um, eggs were laid on some hard surface and they weren't seen because you know, it kind of looks like a, a splash of mud and weren't really detected as an insect and then they were able to hatch out here. So again, those instars are fairly um, uh, conspicuous looking in addition to the adults. 
Um, usually the adults will, um, you'll see them with their wings folded over their backs. In some cases when they're flying or if they're startled, you'll see um, that bright red um, patch on their hind wings. Um, so, so again, this is very obvious looking, but you'll usually see them with their wings folded over their back. Now, before we talk a little bit more about spotted lanternfly, I just want to back up and make sure that everybody knows that spotted lanternfly is, is a hemipterans, but has piercing sucking mouth parts. It's related to things like cicadas, stink bugs, and aphids. Um, so again, piercing sucking mouth parts um, that enable them to tap into a plant that they're feeding on and suck the sap or the phloem, so their phloem feeders. Again, you can see that um, happening with this adult here. It's got its mouth parts tapped into the plant and is sucking out that phloem. So when we look at the host range of spotted lanternfly, um, it has a series of what we are, are right now calling preferred hosts. Um, the number one preferred host right now is Tree of Heaven. That is an invasive tree um, that is fairly common throughout Pennsylvania and the rest of the US. Um, it's often on roadsides and ditches. Um, it's it's a misnamed, definitely. It's definitely not a Tree of Heaven. It grows quickly um, and it's, it's found throughout most of the US. Um, however, they also feed heavily on black walnut, grape, and hops as well, um, but it doesn't stop there. They have a recorded host range of over 70 different plants, um, so that includes um, commercial apple trees, maples, birch, sycamore, sumac, um, and as we're learning more about this insect, we're continuing to find new hosts and also find new um, what we're calling preferred hosts, and it seems like it is maybe weather dependent, and so again, we're, we're still learning a lot about this insect. Um, so when we see spotted lanternfly populations in southeastern Pennsylvania, we can see very high populations. So this is an example of spotted lanternfly adults feeding on an uh, apple tree, commercial apple tree. Um, you'll notice that they're not feeding on the apple, they're feeding on the uh, trunk of the tree, they're feeding on the branches, but they are not direct fruit pests. Again, they're feeding on that, on that phloem of the tree. However, doing this during harvest has the potential to reduce the quality of the harvest, affect the apple, and also um, long-term potentially affect the tree. We're seeing the same thing in grape with very high populations, again, feeding on the grapevine, not directly on the grape fruit. Um, but the other thing to know about spotted lanternfly, if you watch this video, you'll see that as they feed, they're excreting uh, what we call honeydew. So they're full on feeders, which means that they're taking in a lot of the nutrients from the plant. Um, but they're also getting a lot of excess sugar water from that plant. So what they need to do is excrete that. So that is what we call honeydew, um, but it's basically just a sugar water substance. If you look below where these adults are feeding, you might also see um, pools of this honeydew. So what we're seeing is that this honeydew starts to build up around the surfaces that they're feeding on. Um, and after that, we see this establishment of sooty mold. So sooty molds um, is kind of a, a, a growth of different fungi and, and bacteria in the mix. Um, and what this does is act as a sunblock for the plant. So it doesn't allow the plants to complete photosynthesis. In some cases, we'll also see sooty mold build up on, on the apples or on the grape itself. Um, and that has all sorts of concerns for um, harvest. When we think about city mold in other areas, so if we think about forest uh, environments, we're seeing that there's a lot of city molds and honeydew uh, on the understory plants. And this has the potential to kill off these understory plants and affect regeneration of forests long term. So again, there's a lot of unknowns that we're, we're seeing here um, and, and trying to understand what is likely to happen with, with forests long term um, and, and talking about regeneration and talking about saplings. Um, but this is certainly a consequence that we are paying attention to. So when we just talk about the damage on a broad scale and how the plant is responding, um, some plants will start to ooze. Um, we do see leaf curling, wilting, and flagging of trees. And in some cases we have seen um, with really heavy feeding, especially after repeated years, we have seen trees die. Mostly this has just been tree of heaven and black walnut. Uh, we are seeing yield losses in apple and grape in, ad in addition to uh, apple, uh, excuse me, grapevines actually dying and grapevines not being able to produce the following year after having heavy feeding by spotted lanternfly. Um, as of today, we are not aware of any pathogens that are transmitted by uh, spotted lanternfly. Um, they certainly may have the capacity to do this, especially talking about mechanical transmission, um, but we are still looking into this. And then again, that sooty mold, so decreased photosynthesis of the 
plant and potentially killing off young plants. Uh, not only is this, you know, an environmental concern, an agricultural concern, but it's also a nuisance problem. So people who have heavy spotted lanternfly uh, infestations in their backyard might have a lot of honeydew uh, raining down on their decks, on their outdoor patio sets, child play toys, things like that. And then they get this colonization of sooty mold on their decks and on their belongings. Uh, so this woman had a serious infestation and she had to power wash her her deck multiple times that year in order to get rid of that sooty mold. So that bottom step there is after she had power washed and the top steps were, were not yet power washed. You can see that um, residents are dealing with this in their backyard. Again, high populations right next to this um, kid's car. And uh, on the right, we see that kind of sheen of the honeydew and a little bit of sooty mold. So people are dealing with this in their backyards and it's certainly something that, um, you know, we don't want to, you know we don't want people to have to deal with this with going outside and having spotted lantern fly fly in their faces crawl on them get inside um, so really this this problem stems um, across a lot of different industries and affected um, stakeholders now we do have um, uh, steps of spotted lantern fly management for the affected industries and stakeholders um, and part of these are, are just basic um, steps. So again, stop the spread. Make sure that you're inspecting your vehicle before you're moving. If you're buying a grill or a picnic table or something like that on, on Craigslist or from, from a neighbor, then you need to make sure that you're inspecting that before you actually move it outside of the quarantine zone. Um, we can also scrape those eggs. So again, those eggs are laid on hard surfaces like trees, um, picnic tables, things like that. And if we scrape those off, then we can potentially reduce the population from it here. Uh, one of the other things that we're doing is banding trees with sticky paper, um, much like gypsy moth, if you're familiar with that one. Um, those nymphs and adults will crawl up the base of the tree to get to the nice green growth at the top so they can feed. Um, the adults, it doesn't work as well. They tend to avoid the bands or they'll just fly up to the top. Um, but with the nymphs, we are seeing that uh, banding those trees can capture a lot of nymphs. Um, it also has the potential to uh, capture non-targets, so small mammals, so we do have ways to avoid that, um, and I can certainly talk more about that if, if there are any questions about that. Um, the fourth step is, is what we say is removing tree of heaven. This is kind of um, uh, the one that we're focusing on um, uh, with Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and also U.S. Department of Agriculture is doing um, is both removing tree of heaven and uh, treating tree of heaven with systemic insecticides. So again, Tree of Heaven is their preferred host, and we really want to make sure um, that we, we utilize that opportunity as much as possible because it is an invasive tree. We don't see a lot of other insects or animals feeding on Tree of Heaven or utilizing Tree of Heaven. So it's a good opportunity for us to try to um, have control methods in place. Um, and then the last one is applying insecticides. The good thing about spotted lanternfly is that it's pretty easy to kill with insecticides. We have a pretty good arsenal. Unfortunately, spotted lanternfly is everywhere, and again, it's feeding on any, everything. So if you're, you're out in an orchard and you're looking at spotted lanternfly within your orchard, you can also see the wood line adjacent to that and somebody's, maybe somebody's backyard next to that. Um, and so really, spotted lanternfly, um, kind of the whole, the whole landscape is their buffet, and they're able to take advantage of a lot of different hosts. So that means that we need to be really smart about how we apply our insecticides, which insecticides we apply, and also where. Um, and again, I'm happy to talk a little bit more uh, about that if there's questions about that, but I really want to give um, fully the opportunity to talk about some of the research. So I'll turn it over to her. Okay, um, hi everyone. So um, to give a context for the research update and the questions that we're really focused on answering right now about the plant fly, um, I want to talk kind of more generally first about why we know so little about this insect. Um, there's there's a, several different factors that kind of um, create a perfect storm in a sense. Um, Heather did a great job in explaining the life cycle of this insect. And basically it just goes through one generation per year. And so the eggs, they overwinter as eggs. The nymphs hatch out at the very beginning of June. And um, we go through the series of nymphal instars just about now, like several weeks ago, we've, we've seen the first adults and we've not yet seen mating and egg laying. And so with an insect that is so long lived, we see the first adults appear in the end of July and they will persist into the first frost, you know, past even the first frost. I was collecting 
adults the first week of December last year. And so with such a long life cycle, um, it's very challenging to, um, to study this insect in that it was first detected in 2014. And so this field season is just our fourth in dealing with this insect. Um, also, this insect, um, especially as adults, um, generally feeds upon the phloem of trees. Um, for these insects to feed and, and live as adults from July into December, they're voracious phloem feeders. And so to date, um, no colony has yet been established um, successfully to, to use to study lanternfly, not in Korea and not yet here in the US. There's several of our groups are attempting this, but um, unlike something like spotted wing or softlow where you get many generations, you know, in a very short period of time, you know, it's very challenging to study something that is so long lived and we cannot yet rear. Um, in the context of other plant hoppers, you know, there are other plant hoppers that are, you know, as flow and feeders that are serious pests of agriculture. Um, but primarily those, um, the, the biggest culprits there are plant hoppers in the family Delphacidae and the family Cixiidae. And these are, um, uh, lanternflies are not like these insects at all. These other plant hopper pests tend to be very limited in the host that they deplete that they feed upon, and they tend to be major uh, pests of cereal crops. And so they're certainly important. So for example, Milliparvata lugans is one of what we call a rice plant hopper. And when you get an outbreak of this rice plant hopper in Asia, it can knock rice production down by 80%. And so certainly there's quite a bit known about um, these rice plant hoppers and, and plant hoppers of other um, cereal commodities. But there you have, again, multiple generations a year and you have a you know they're they're focusing these are feeding on um only you know one or two particular crops those crops are grown and harvested that year plant hoppers in fulgority um, with our spotted lanternfly are feeding on trees that are long lived those trees aren't harvested typically and so basically we have um every like the whole situation in terms of not just the insect's life history, but its impact on the plants is now extended across a greater range of time. And so that certainly is, makes it challenging for us to learn things. And so um, when I first started working, um, when, we, when this insect was first detected and identified as lanternfly in September of 2014, the USDA immediately pulled together a scientific working group that included myself and other scientists around the country and around the world. And we each began our research projects, um, mine studying on the genetics of the origin of lanternfly and looking at microbial associates of it. And other folks started looking at lures, started looking at behavior and whatnot. And so we were certainly making progress. But what was very interesting, um, and you can kind of see it in, if you recall the photo that Heather showed in terms of the spread of lanternfly. We saw a very constrained population in that first year, you know, that field season in 2015. It expanded a bit more in 2016. And then last year, um, as we were working out in the field, that was my first season actually here at Penn State, um, we saw that the numbers of lanternfly, the populations were much higher than anyone had expected. Um, it was a surprise in a sense to the researchers, and certainly as um, it, was, it was the first time we really saw economic damage to grapes. And at the end of the season last year, we observed lights of lanternfly in high densities and for the first time that movement onto apple and peach. And so at that point, um, it became apparent that this was a crisis that required much more cooperation and collaboration and a unified front of researchers. And so um, while there's a lot of research that's continuing, um, uh, in my role here at Penn State, um, what I've had the opportunity to do is um, help to organize um, money from Penn State and from the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture to try to get immediate um, management solutions that are research-based up and going. And so um, that's largely what I'm going to talk with you about today. Um, but also because we have, as I said, other scientists in the scientific working group working on different projects, 
Um, I've been working to try to coordinate overall research, not just at Penn State, but with some of these other folks. So we're pursuing larger multi-year grants, but at this point, all research on spotted lanternfly um, has been funded just by one-year uh, grants from USDA Farm Bill, from um, also from Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and some internal money from Penn State. And so with, those, with that, um, some of the studies that we've been doing is to look at um, how to manage it chemically. And so um, we've had colleagues here at Penn State, um, Greg Krawcheck in particular, who worked with a grower out at an orchard, um, to look at the efficacy of various insecticides against egg cases. Um, this isn't, you know, as these insects will lay their eggs on anything, um, they can lay their eggs 30 feet up into the top of a tree. It's not going to be really effective to chemically control the egg cases in the wild, but because egg cases can be laid on things like apple crates or on beehives, whatnot, it, you know, it's really important in those situations to determine what can kill those egg cases that are at high risk of transport. And so um, we'll have recommendations coming out from that work that's currently wrapping up. Um, in a study uh, that Heather and um, I assisted with, with led by Dave Bittinger at, um, who's, a, who's at the Fruit Research Experimental Station here at Penn State. Um, we tested 20 different insecticides um, against spotted lanternfly, and we tested the contact effects and then looked at residual effects on nymphs and adults. And um, Heather has summarized those and written those up into recommendations thus far. And so those are available. And based on those results, um, we've added, is it eight or is it 10 double E labels? Well, yeah, so basically spotted lanternfly has been added to um, 10 uh, labels for 10 different compounds. Starting next week, um, we've been swamped by the weather here. Um, it's, we've had a lot of rain and I don't think that's gonna change with the hurricane coming up. But basically, we'll be testing um, compounds on um, grapevines as well against adult spotted lanternfly. Certainly, um, grapes in particular and then other tree fruits are where we've seen economic damage so far. That's the only place we've seen economic damage so far with spotted lanternfly. Um, and that's where it was seen at the high, having the highest impact as in, as, um, in Korea. But certainly, um, as you saw from the pictures of um, all the individuals on trees in people's backyards um, that you know we're, we're worried about ornamentals and so we're worried about ornamentals from the homeowner perspective and more broadly from the green industry and so here we're working with um, two different industry um, representatives rainbow and arborjet in order to collect scientific data on um, effect of different compounds on um, killing lanternflies on ornamentals and we'll have recommendations up with that as I indicated, um, we are working on trying to rear spotted lanternfly in a quarantine colony. Um, we have quarantine facilities here where we're trying to rear them, but as much as we replace, you know, give them new trees to feed upon, they're just voracious. USDA Otis Lab in Massachusetts has done similar things. They can keep them living, but again, not through mating and not overwintering. And so um, Tracy Lesky, who's a scientist at the USDA in West Virginia, at the ARS facility in West Virginia, who um, she led the brown marmorated stink bug fight. We're so happy that she's on our research team. Um, she's gotten permission from Fort Detrick to rear spotted lanternfly in their quarantine laboratory. Um, we are still waiting for permits. All um, improvements have been made to that lab. And when we're able to move lanternfly into that lab, she'll be able to test insecticides under highly controlled lab conditions um, and also look at more fundamental aspects of their biology. But we don't have yet have that in place. Um, Miriam Cooperman is one of the USDA scientists, APHIS scientists, who was an original member of the scientific working group. And she works at, an Otis, at the Otis lab in um, Massachusetts, and they're leading quite a number of studies, but um, one of the things that she's done is she's tested uh, different lures that seem to be attractive to spotted lanternfly. She's developed a methyl salicylate lure, and she's testing that as is a, a, um, in collaboration with um, Heather Leach and Tracy Lesky 
Um, they're using that lure against multiple trap designs, and this is work that's being done in Pennsylvania, where we have high spotted landerfly densities, and in Virginia, low um, landerfly densities in that Win Winchester area. And so, results of that are, you know, data are still being collected weekly. Other things, um, we're interested in what is this doing to the physiology of host plants? And so with respect to grapes, um, many of you are probably aware, in order to make appropriate recommendations to growers about um, when and how to spray, it's important to determine economic threshold. What is the level of SLF, in this case, spotted lanternfly feeding, that um, is enough to warrant uh, increased costs associated with applying an additional spray or other management method. And so my PhD student, Erica Smyers, has a study that's going um, out at a vineyard right now in Manitani, in an area that is actually, as of yesterday, receiving higher uh, spotted lantern fly pressure as we speak. But basically what we've done there is the, um, the vineyard owner allowed us to plant 83 year old grapevines in the ground um, on his vineyard and we've constructed cages surrounding each individual plant um, pvc cages with um, fine netting um, over each and in that um, we've begun to introduce different levels of slf feeding um, operationalized as different numbers of spotted lanternfly introduced um, we needed to let the grapes established and so those studies just began um, two weeks ago now where uh, different numbers of spotted lanternfly adults have been introduced and allowed to feed on those grapes. And we're testing various measures of plant physiology, shoot growth, um, bricks or sugar content in the grapes. Um, we'll look at hardiness, among other things, photosynthesis. And then those same grapes will be um, looked at again next year and in subsequent years where we can test nymphal and adult um, feeding and effects on physiology. But there, what we're really interested in is um, in particular, as Heather indicated, some vineyards um, where we saw heavy feeding, just you know, two or three vineyards last year um, that had heavy feeding, their vines did not survive the winter. And then subsequently, um, vines that did survive the winter, many did not produce. And so again, this is a, everything is, um, that's a development of really the last month or so. And so we're certainly interested in measuring in as much detail as we can exactly what lanternfly is doing to those, to those grapes in order to predict uh, damage and prevent against it. Similarly, in terms of ornamentals here, trees are even longer lived. And so, as Heather indicated, we see some weeping, some oozing, um, some dieback, it appears, in some, in some tree of heaven or ailanthus, but that's, that's a longer term process. And so we're trying to collect data on that as well. Um, actually, if I wanna go back to that really quickly, um, also with that, um, we're looking at just some fundamental aspects of spotted lanternfly biology looking at the proteomics of the salivary glands and whatnot and damage, like physical damage induced by feeding. And so that's a whole series of studies that um, we're getting going. Um, certainly the, you know, this is a, a, a perfect situation to explore classical biological control. And here we have several labs that have worked on that. Kim Palmer, who is an expert in, um, in biological control in spotted wing drosophila and a number of other insect pests is, is on our team, as is Julie Gould at the Otis Lab and Hu Ping Lu at Forestry. And basically they're looking um, to determine um, if they can find in Asia um, predators and parasitoids of spotted lanternfly that they could potentially bring here. Uh, my colleague Charles Bartlett is looking at effects of any imported bio biological control agents on non-target plant hoppers. And then certainly we're looking at, they are looking for native parasitoids that may already be using the egg cases of spider lanternfly. And in a paper that Hu Ping Lu um, published uh, last year, or the year before I believe, they did find that there are two parasitoids, um, one parasitoid that was um, introduced here a number of decades ago for um, gypsy moth is using um, spotted lanternfly eggs. 
to yet. It's at a low percentage of infection rate, but we're certainly watching that and looking for additional other native parasitoids. Um, the behavior of adult spotted lanternflies being looked at primarily by Tom Baker, who's a scientist um, here at Penn State. And so he began looking for sex pheromones, and to date, no sex pheromones have been detected for um, spotted lanternfly. No plant hoppers are known to produce pheromones, so that's not really a big surprise. And they're known to use um, substrate-borne communication. And so that's something that Tom is looking at as um, in collaboration with folks in my lab. But interestingly here, we're interested in trying to time out um, exactly the, the mating and dispersal of lanternfly. As I indicated earlier, we saw a flush of lanternfly, um, a flush of lanternfly flight last year. Um, and the videos you can see online or that photo um, that Heather showed and the one I have here of lanternfly going into the apple um, was taken on, on September 11th and September 12th of, of 2017. And so you can see in this picture here, lanternflies in flight. And that's kind of an unusual thing. We did not see that all season. Um, in fact, this orchard was an orchard where we observed lanternfly on grapes all year. They had never been on the apple it, that year or previous years until this flight behavior occurred. And then suddenly they swarmed the apples, were there for a couple of weeks and moved on. And so in this dispersal um, behavior of flying adult spotted lanternfly, what we observed there is that it was only after they settled back down and had uh, fed very heavily um, that any mating was observed. And so here, um, if you see the picture I, sh I show on the right where we have that pretty spotted lanternfly, sorry, I'm a plant hopper geek, um, pretty spotted lanternfly with a bright yellow abdomen, we do not see that essentially distended bright yellow abdomen until um, the females are able to sit and really fatten up. And if you see a lanternfly that fat, that's when the eggs developed, they're no good at flying, they're not very good at much movement. And so we're interested, we've only observed mating before that, but we certainly want to time this out to determine if when females are flying, have they mated? Are we at risk of dispersal and potentially colonization in new places at that point or not? Also, um, I'm looking at the genetic markers, as I indicated. My little graph down here shows that just kind of summarizes um, that we know so far Korea is not the origin, but um, basically what we're seeing there is a pattern of just genetic variation and the big square of green on the left is the variation I have with the current markers I'm using for spotted lanternfly, which means I need to develop new markers that will give us more signal. So that's in progress. Also, we're looking at the sooty mold um, development. I mean, we're interested here in what um, microbes actually comprise these sooty mold communities. We're use, using high thro throughput DNA sequencing to look at that. Um, we're also looking at, in my lab, these obligate bacterial symbionts and other gut microbial communities and in association with host plant preferences of lanternfly. And in terms of control, the potential to disrupt endosymbiont transmission as potentially um, a way to highly, that's highly specific to control lanternfly. Also, as I mentioned before, we are doing a number of feeding studies. We have other folks here, Kelly Hoover um, is looking at um, the extent to which spotted lanternfly may or may not require tree of heaven or Ailanthus altissima to complete its life cycle. Um, we're also looking at um, what trees, what makes for an attractive tree from a lanternfly perspective, because we certainly see um, some interesting patterns there and they do show distinct preferences um, for certain trees. And so we're doing things like measuring um, phloem and, and uh, water and whatnot to try to, and, and different nutrients to determine um, what trees are attractive. Also, um, as I'd indicated before, looking at artificial diets and basic feeding biology. And so that's uh, an overview of what I know that's going on in the research. Um, I, we're up to, that completes our presentation, so we're happy to take any questions you may have. Okay. Um, can I have a question here. Can you please tell us what compounds work against it? Have you seen any predators attacking the spotted lantern flies? 
Yeah, so um, you can go for the compound uh, one first. So depending on, on what industry you're in and what is the equipment, um, in the forestry industry, uh, they're primarily using the two active ingredients, hydrocyanin and imidacloprid, grid, um, either as injection, bark sprays, or uh, soil trenches, and those seem to be working well. Um, and that's what primarily what the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture and USDA is using, as well as a lot of other um, landscape companies to control flooded lantern in people's backyards. Um, in the agricultural industry, in terms of um, talking about uh, grapes and, and apples and peaches, we're seeing again um, imidacloprid and um, uh, dinotefurin are options. Um, is, can everybody hear me okay? It looks like there's a comment that says I'm, I'm muffled. You are a little muffled. Okay. I got, well, I got off as soon as possible here. I'll try again. I'll, I'll try to uh, speak a little closer here. Um, so in the agricultural industries, um, we're seeing that um, dinotypurine and imidacloprid are, are still um, working well, but we have a, a few other options there. Um, imidan and bifenthrin um, are two compounds that are having really good residual activity, so a 14-day residual activity. So that's um, Promising. Unfortunately, those products are a little bit expensive, um, but even uh, products that you might use for stink bug or Japanese beetle, so instance, carbaryl, um, malathion, things like that are working for spotted lanternfly control. Their residual activity just isn't going to be as good. Um, but as I said, there's a lot of compounds that do effectively kill it. Um, in terms of organic compounds, there are some options there. Um, those are really dependent. You, you need to make sure you have good uh, contact sprays for those. So making sure your contact and spotted lantern fly. Um, so things like insecticidal soap, horticultural oils, things like that are working, but the residual activity is not good. Um, so we need to make sure again that we have good contact. Activity. Um, and then as far as biological control for spotted lanternfly, we do see some predators here feeding on spotted lanternfly. Um, these are generalist predators, so things like um, predatory stink bugs, spiders, praying mantises, wheel bugs have all been recorded. Um, it's great to see that, but because these are generalist predators, we can't expect that they're going to control the population, which is another reason that we're really interested in looking at classical biological control to hopefully get that long-term sustainable control um, as some of you might know, that's a long-term process, so hopefully in five to ten years we'll have um, better answers for that one, um, but, but that is a, a long process of, of lab testing before we can get those. And the, um, the compounds that are effective against the lantern fly for different sectors, um, all of those text sheets are available on the Penn State Extension website. There's a Penn State Extension Spotted Lanternfly Specialized Site. And um, we, we, by we, I mean Heather, and, and other folks at Penn State are actively um, updating and writing those handouts as soon as our data are analyzed. The page that you're looking for, and you can learn a little bit more about some of the management recommendations as far as insecticide. So, Okay, and in that vein, I have um, a question here. When should the neonicotinoids be applied? Are they being used as soil applied systemics or a foliar product? Other, oh, oh, other pyrethroids, lambda, I, okay, I can't say that word. Um, <laughs> uh, do, does neem work as a repellent? Um, so neem, um, is, I guess I'll answer backwards. Um, neem oil, as far as we know, we haven't tested it as a repellent. Um, anecdotally, there have been some reports of neem and some other insecticides that might be repelling spotted lanternfly. However, we have no data to really um, back that one up. Um, so, so maybe, but as far as we know right now, neem will work as a contact insecticide, but again, residual is very short on that product. Um, Lambda Psi, I don't believe anybody's tried that in our, in our trials, um, since it's uh, becoming a, a less common um, product, at least in the agricultural industry. Um, so in, in the forestry industry, again, we've really depended so far on dinotefuran and imidacloprid. Um, so in terms of when the neonic should be applied, um, if, you're gonna do, if you're gonna do a systemic product, it should be applied um, in in early summer, so talking about starting in July and starting to um, 
tamp down uh, right now. So making your last um, uh, systemic applications now. Um, so those are applied again, either tree injection, bark spray or soil drench. Um, we're seeing that tree injection is um, working really well in order to maintain residual. Um, in some cases, maybe even too well, depending on um, watching out for pollinators in the following year and, and if that um, insecticide is making its way into the flowers. Um, so it's still something that we're working on. A lot of this information we're using from pre-existing data of people who have looked at systemic um, products in, in um, both the agricultural industry and forest um, for other uh, control. So for instance, for emerald ash borer, looking at um, the control used there and, and how long those those products stay along, stay stay around. Okay, so you you yeah. are saying that the um, is this? I have a question. Is this after trees have flowered to a, to avoid the pollinator injury? Exactly. Yep. Yeah. So any any product, especially systemics that you're applying, you want to make sure that you're applying it um, after the flowers um, have senesced. So thank you for that reminder. All right, um, any other questions, anyone? Okay, seeing none at this time, um, I wanted to thank you so much for this. Oh wait, here's one. Would you please describe the flight behavior of adults you found on apples again? Yes, and so um, uh, lanternflies um, are not great flyers. Um, basically, they'll climb up a vertical surface and they will take and they will take off they don't just drop but they they will fly um, the longest uh, tom baker has observed any any one flight bout um to date has been 61 seconds and so they'll fly and land either on the ground or on a tree walk up and feed and then basically engage in these serial bouts of flight um, we only see that occurring in the late summer. So up until this point, when we've seen spotted lantern fly feeding on Tree of Heaven or whatnot, they tend to be pretty lazy and just um, feed at the base of the plant. They might, if, if disrupted, they'll fly away and come back, but they're generally not very active. Um, we, we are hypothesizing um, and, and following this up with data collection this year, that as the trees um, that they've fed upon heavily for a couple of months um, as those trees start to senesce or when the insects have tapped them out, um, that that is what triggers this um, flight behavior, the serial, um, the serial bouts of flight that I described. And so um, we observed that last year and when we, um, this was, wasn't published in the Korean literature. And so our collaborator, Tracy Lesky, um, visited uh, an entomology meeting of Korean scientists last spring. And one of the things she asked was if they observed um, this flight behavior. And they said they did observe um, these insects to fly prior to mating and fattening up, you know, in the late summer, early fall, as we did. But when they were shown videos of the flight in the apple orchard last year, they remarked that they had not seen such straight, strong flight behavior in their populations, that um, what we saw last year was an anomaly to them as well. All right, thank you. Um, how many states have so far recorded its appearance? Um, Brian Hendricks says he's a Tennessee naturalist and this is the first he's heard of this insect. Yep, it's also pretty regional. So um, we have established populations that are um, in Pennsylvania and in Virginia. Um, we only, within this last year, has it been determined that there's established breeding populations in New Jersey and just the several counties that are adjacent in Maryland, not, uh, not in Maryland, in Delaware. We've had a live individual detected in Maryland, but no evidence of an established population. We've had um, detections of live individuals in New York, uh, even most recently. Up until these recent detections, there's been no evidence of any established populations in New York. Um, those scouting 
that scouting for established populations from these two newly reported sightings is currently underway. But um, from reports in each of those cases, it was only a single individual that was detected. And so that's, that's kind of where we are at this point. It's all um, states adjacent to our Pennsylvania um, uh, population. Mm -hmm. What do you think the risk of spread is? That's a, exactly what I was about to ask you too. <laughs> Elizabeth beat me to it. <laughs> well, in um, it, basically human, trans, human mediated transport is the big thing. They can lay their eggs on anything, um, ATVs, vehicles, pallets of wood, whatnot. And so, um, and these egg cases, because they look like a smear of mud, can be almost invisible. And so certainly that's how we, understand or, or strongly suspect that landernfly got here to Pennsylvania. And so we're worried um, that these insects um, may lay their eggs and those eggs are what can move. And so we're looking certainly along rail line corridors. If you think about um, areas where you have tree of heaven, which is a common host, uh, tree of heaven tends to grow in disturbed habitat. Um, if you look along a rail line corridor, you will often see tree of heaven trees. And so um, movement from eggs being deposited on rail cars, other vehicles, or goods that are transported. Um, so along rail lines and highways, um, that's, that's where we're looking for risk of spread and that's, that's the risk of highest spread of lantern fly. Okay. Um, well, this has all been really good information, um, really kind of bringing this up to speed on this. I, um, I'm kind of uh, interested in this too because I do grow, grow some grapes, so this is, a, this is kind of a wake-up call and, you know, if you can't, uh, you know, you need to be aware. So I really appreciate this information as I think all of our participants do. Um, I'm, again, I'm recording this information, so it will be um, available soon on the emeraldashboard.info website. And again, I'd like to thank our presenters, Heather and Julie, and uh, everyone who attended for all your input, and thank you for being here. Um, I'm um, going to, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Actually, I was going to say, since, especially since uh, given um, the audience you connect to is kind of, is more maybe more forestry oriented. I just wanted to follow up on the grape observation um, with something just, just that might tie into forestry. Um, we certainly see lantern fly on wild grape as well. And so um, we don't know to what extent lantern fly might be a pest of forests. Um, this was a question that was asked in Korea because it didn't appear in the Korean literature that it did much impact in forests. And certainly that's what we're worried about here in, in the Northeast US. And so um, when asked, the Korean researchers said, yes, in fact, they did see some damage to um, forests there, but because those trees weren't economically important, that impact was not quantified. And while they didn't publish a pop evidence of a population crash in Korea, they did introduce a parasitoid as a biocontrol agent, shortly after which they recognized that that parasitoid was already there. And so their populations, you know, kind of crashed and they'll see an outburst every several years, but it's not a problem. It, it's a problem, but it's not, you know, it, not, it didn't wreck their forest and whatnot. So here, what we're interested in is monitoring the health of the forest, particularly as spotted lanternfly um, can feed on wild grape in forest and might be able to use wild grape to kind of, as a network to get into more interior forested regions. Um, and with the effect of sooty mold on understory growth um, could affect nutrient cycling. And so we're certainly watching it very carefully. We have other folks in various forests, um, US Forest Service, um, state forestry and whatnot that are looking at that. But I think that that's certainly an area of, of concern and an area to be aware and that um, we're continuing to study to determine impacts on forested systems. Thank you very much. All right, um, I think that's gonna be it. If you have other questions, I will be, to those of you who attended today, I'll be sending out an email to you and I'll include um, <clears throat> Heather and Julie's contact information and email um, so that you can, if you have further questions, you can um, 
you can contact them. Again, thank you, and uh, thanks for attending our first uh, fall webinar here in 2018. And I hope to see you all again at our next webinar. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, Robin.